The Bible is the historical account of everything. And if we want to know where we began, we need to look no further than the book of Genesis. We welcome you to this lesson of A Creation Series. Churches in America, typically, they are not the places where people talk about dinosaurs and rocks and fossils and the age of the earth and all that kind of thing. We should, because the Bible has all that in it. The Bible is, is definitely a book that talks about sociology and geology and biology and history and, and cosmology. The problem is we've left all of these issues up to secular colleges and secular high schools to teach our children. And we wonder kind of what happened to them at the end. When they left the house, they leave church all too often. And it ought not be that way. We've been on the road a long time and we've seen this play out over and over again. And it doesn't have to be that way. What does the Bible say about the heavens? What does evolutionism say about the heavens? Are cosmologists sure about anything? Does the Bible have anything to say about space? This and more on today's lesson of a creation seminar. In this lesson, I want to touch on just a few examples of comparisons between what the Bible says and what evolution says concerning the sun, moon, and stars, concerning what is out there. The Bible says in Psalm 19.1, and most people know this, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And that certainly is a true statement. <laughs> that word is truth, no question about it. But we're going to see some amazing things that you have probably not thought about. Independent UK wrote this article, The universe is just a big hologram, astrophysicists claim. They say there is as much evidence for the holographic universe as there is for traditional explanations. Now, the thing that is interesting to me, if there is as much evidence for a holographic universe as there is for the traditional explanations, that to me tells me they have no evidence for the traditional explanations. Keep this thought in mind. Cosmology has some big problems. This is Scientific American, April 30th, 2019. So we're not talking all that long ago. I'm going to give you some, uh, just some of this article. The entire article is lengthy, but boy, oh boy, is it good. But let me just show you a few, I think, good points. Compounding this problem, most observations of the universe occur experimentally and indirectly. Wait a minute, if the observations of the universe occur experimentally and indirectly, uh, what's it telling us? Well, look at the next sentence. Today's space telescopes provide no direct view of anything. Okay, let me ask you a question. How many of you watching this, or in, in, after you watch this, ask your friends and family and such, co-workers, what the space telescopes provide pictures of and images of. They're going to think it's everything they see. But why does it say they provide no direct view of anything? Folks, the fact of the matter is, they don't. This is amazing. But the article goes on. They produce measurements through an interplay of theoretical predictions and pliable parameters. Well, if they produce measurements through interplay of theoretical predictions and pliable parameters, you see how wishy-washy that can be, right? Let's keep going in which the model is involved every step of the way. The framework literally frames the problem. It determines how and where to observe. Well, what if the framework is wrong? That talks about that too. Let's keep reading. And so, despite the advanced technologies and methods involved, the profound limitations to the endeavor also increase the risk of being led astray by the kind of assumptions that cannot be calculated. Folks, this whole article goes on and on and on, and they admit that they have nothing. Look how it some starts to sum it up here. A few astrophysicists, such as Michael J. Disney, have criticized the Big Bang paradigm for its lack of demonstrated certainties. In his analysis, the theoretical framework has far fewer certain observations than free parameters to tweak them, a so-called negative significance that would be an alarming sign for any science. It's an alarming sign for this science too, but they still just keep plowing right on through. Keeps going. As Disney writes in American Scientist, a skeptic is entitled to feel that a negative significance after so much time, effort, and trimming is nothing more than one would expect of a folk tale constantly re-edited to fit inconvenient new observations. Now folks, this is not me saying it. This is in Scientific American in April 30th of 2019. They're talking about how their cosmology is basically a folk tale. You know, if I was to just bring that up and dream that up and say it myself, boy, I would be ridiculed and laughed out of the park as the saying goes but they admit themselves. The problem is what goes into the textbooks is presented as a fact. Their folktale is presented as a fact. What goes into museum displays is presented as a fact. People see it reconfirmed all over the place as a, 
as a presented fact and people tend to start to believe it. My wife and I said for a couple of years now we've noticed that space has become the new dinosaur. And uh, as far as evolutionists are concerned. And what we mean by that is that the space issue is now the new dinosaur issue in a sense that for years, the devil used dinosaurs to try to draw people away from the Bible, try to get people to believe that they lived millions of years ago, tens of millions of years ago, and a you know, comet hit this place and killed them and all that kind of thing. And they still, that's still being used. But today, space issues have become a huge, huge thing. I always leave time for question and answer at our, at our meetings these days and for the last couple of years. And, and I'm telling you, space issues come up all the time because it is being pushed out there by the evolutionist camp. Look what Discover Magazine wrote in April 2015. It takes a special kind of personality to argue passionately about the nature of objects that are hundreds of trillions of miles away, impossible to see, impossible to even describe using the known laws, and it goes on and on. It takes a special kind of personality to argue passionately about stuff you've never seen or you can't see. But I am simply saying they teach their stuff as a fact to our children. And our children, I've talked to them over and over and over over the course of the last many years. These issues draw our kids away because they learn something that they think does not square up with what the Bible says. And it doesn't square up with what the Bible says. But I'm saying they think in their minds, they're trying as kids to figure out what's right and what's wrong. And when all we have are Bible stories and all they have are a bunch of facts, it starts to mess with their thinking pattern. And I've seen it over and over throughout the years. And it's time to put that stuff to a stop because it is time to expose they don't have a clue. They truly don't have a clue. Scientific American wrote this in January 2007. What is a planet? What is a planet? The controversial new official definition of planet which banished Pluto has its flaws, but by and large captures the essential scientific principles. Now, Pluto was discovered, and it was always considered the ninth planet in the solar system. That stuck until 2006. Late 2006, they actually said they get, that there's a new definition of what a planet is. In January 2007, they wrote it in science publications where they kicked Pluto out of being called a planet. Look what a definition of planet is. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. Planet. Any of the large bodies that revolve around the sun in the solar system, a similar body associated with another star. Look at definition C here. Any of the seven celestial bodies. Sun, Moon, Venus, Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, Saturn. Now wait a second. How many of you have ever thought or looked up the word planet and seen the Sun and the Moon in the definition of planet? That is interesting. Once again, if I was just to say that, that'd be considered some goofball or something, but that's what the definition is. As a matter of fact, let's look how they say it. Science News wrote this in April 2017. What's a planet? Pluto is a planet. It always has been. It always will be, says Will Grundy of Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Now he just has to convince the world. For centuries, the word planet meant wanderer and included the sun, moon, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Eventually, the moon and sun were dropped from the list and Uranus and Neptune were added along with Pluto after its discovery in 1930. The idea of a planet as a roundish, rocky, or gaseous body that orbits the sun stuck until 2006. So in 2006, they said it's not a planet, but now this guy at, at Lowell Observatory is saying, yes, it is a planet. Now he has to f just convince the world, the, the article says. They don't even know if Pluto is a planet. Here I'm showing you the, art the articles, and I've got lots of these kind of things. But they don't even know if, if Pluto is a planet. But it's taught as a fact when it's taught in the textbooks. Most people watching this will have been taught that Pluto is the ninth planet in our solar system. And then they said it's not. Now they say it is. They don't have a clue. But also they say the sun and the moon are planets. Well, they were planets, and then they kicked them out of the list. See how they don't have a clue? They don't know. Well, we went to NASA in Houston, and over the uh, entry, one of the doors, it said, this is a quote from Carl Sagan, imagination will often carry us to worlds that never were, but without it, we go nowhere. That's a rather interesting statement, is it not? <laughs> How about the definition of science fiction? Highly imaginative fiction, typically involving some actual or projected scientific phenomena. Do you know that evolutionary cosmology, or whatever you want to call it, it's science fiction. It is highly imaginative fiction, typically involving some actual or projected scientific phenomena. They need it to be what it is. And like I showed you in that, uh, that, that Scientific American article, the evidence that they receive does not fit their concepts and ideas. And it's throwing the whole field in chaos, quite frankly. Now, Institute for Creation Research did an article in their Acts and Facts uh, uh, magazine publication. They did an article on comets. See, the problem with comets is, why do we have them? That's the big problem. Let me read some of this to you. It's amazing. 
Secular scientists believe comets are leftovers from, from the formation of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. Beautiful comet tails form when solar radiation causes ices on the comet nuclei to vaporize as the comet draws near to the sun. Since comets lose material every time their elliptical orbit takes them close to the sun, they should disintegrate in at most hundreds of thousands of years. If the solar system is billions of years old, why do we have these comets? Why do we still have comets? That is a valid question. Basically, they say what a comet is, a big dirty snowball, and as it's flying, it's falling apart. That's why you see the big long white trail, well, the big long tail behind the thing. That's what they claim. Well, you can't fall apart forever. Okay, eventually, you're gonna fall apart. Eventually, there's nothing left to fall apart. Well, they had to come up with an idea about this thing, so they actually did. They came up with their idea, the Oort cloud. Some of you may recall the Oort cloud. You were taught it in school. Most people forgot it. You know, it's just one of those things we don't consider much. But you can look it up. NASA's website gives a depiction of the solar system and then the Oort cloud surrounding and all that kind of thing. But look what it says about it. They have a couple different depictions of it. In 1950, Dutch astronomer Jan Oort, or Jan Oort, however you want to term it, first proposed the idea of this sphere of icy bodies to explain the origins of comets that take thousands of years to orbit the sun. There may be hundreds of billions, even trillions of icy bodies in the Oort cloud. Every now and then, something disturbs one of these icy worlds and it begins its long fall toward the sun. This Oort cloud is out there surrounding the solar system, trillions of these things in this, uh, these icy bodies in this Oort cloud, and then they go talk about how ever so often one gets kicked out and it makes its way towards the sun. And then we can see it as it flies through space. The Oort cloud is too far to be seen with current telescopes, so it hasn't been directly seen or discovered. Okay, today's space telescopes provide no direct view of anything. I think that's a good statement. Do you know that they are admitting that this thing that they are requiring to be there and they're, they're, they need it to be there in order to make their explanations explain what they want to explain, they come out and say, we can't see it, we haven't seen it, we haven't even discovered it yet. Folks, it is purely what they believe to be. But boy, is it taught as a fact. As a matter of fact, Carl Sagan wrote, uh, wrote about this way back in 1985. He said, many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution, yet there is not yet a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. Carl Sagan admitted back in 85 that there is no evidence for its existence, and it's still the same today. Now they're saying this Oort clouds, these Oort clouds exist around other stars out there. You know, they come up with exoplanets and exo-Oort clouds and all this kind of stuff outside of our solar system. Well, listen, they don't even know, and I've shown it, how if Pluto is a planet or not. When they don't even know if one in the solar system is a planet, how are we supposed to believe them? They're finding all these trillions of them out there outside of the solar system. And same with these Oort clouds. Science News wrote this article in 2018, hints of Oort clouds around other stars may lurk in the universe first light. No exo Oort clouds have been spotted yet. The Oort cloud is thought to be something. Scientists think it's something. They say no one has ever seen it. But boy, is it taught as a fact. Absolutely phenomenal. Here's another one. Have you ever thought about this? What is the, what is the sun? What were you taught the sun is? What did they call the sun? They say the sun is a star. We all learned that the sun is a star. As a matter of fact, a star is a type of astronomical object consisting of a luminous spheroid of plasma held together by its own gravity. False color imagery of the sun, a G-type main sequence star, is you know, the closest to the Earth. They say that the sun that we have is a star. That's what we all learned it as. But let's see what God says. In Genesis 1, verse 14 through 16, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. Evolutionists say the sun is a star. God says we have, he put a greater light and a lesser light. One rules the day, one rules the night, and he made the stars also. You'll notice he did not say he made one of those stars to be our greater light. He does not say the greater light is a star. He did not say anything of the sort. He said he made a, the greater light, the lesser light, and the stars also. So we've got a little bit conundrum here. They used to call the sun and the moon a planet. Now they took the sun and the moon out of being called a planet, and now they call the sun a star but they don't have a terminology yet for the moon. They just call it now the moon. But the Bible says it's a greater light and a lesser light, and he made those stars also. You know something about those stars? 
they are where they are. They are what they are. Now, what's interesting is in the early days, and you can read history about this kind of thing, but in the early days of sailing ships, they would use a sextant and a compass. With a sextant and a compass, you could go wherever you needed to go, get there and get back. If your charts are right, you've got your compass and your sextant, you always know where you are and you always know where you're going back to if you need to. In fact, even traversing this land, our country, uh, now I don't like Lewis and Clark, they used uh, you know, riverways and all that for the most part, but they had a sextant and a compass also, and they knew how to use them. When people know how to use these two items, you got the stars out there, Unless it's overcast cloud cover, you can't see them. You can find wherever you need to go if you know how to operate these things because those things are where they are. As a matter of fact, let's look at the next verse in the Bible. God said he set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the fourth day. On that fourth day, God put these things out there, but it says he set them. You know, that word set is the same word that a jeweler would use to set a, a, a diamond in a necklace or something like that. That jeweler doesn't just take those a handful of diamonds and throw them at the piece of gold laying there, whatever the case may be, and hope something falls in the right place and stays. No, no, no. That person will, oftentimes with magnification will intentionally set that thing exactly where it's supposed to be. That is the same word that's used for what God did to those sun, moon, and stars out there. In fact, let's look at the definition. Now, the definition is lengthy, but I, but I want to show you some of it here. This is amazing. To give, to put, make, add, apply, appoint, ascribe, assign, cause, charge, commit, consider, count, deliver, deliver up, direct, distribute, fasten, frame, give, give forth, give over, give up, grant, hang, hang up, occupy, ordain, place. That is fascinating to me. That is exactly what those sun, moon, and stars are, how they were put there. They were placed there. They were ordained there. We are in a room right now. I'm in a room. You're probably in a room, unless you're outside watching this or something, but you're probably in a room. You go to church, you're in a room. You go to work, you're in a room. You know, those rooms all have lights in them. Now, there are a couple of interesting things. God says, let there be light, and there was light. But then he made the sun with stars. He placed lights in the firmament of the heaven. Those two light words are different, just as it is different here. There's light in this room, but there are lights in this room. Those are two different words. But what is interesting is the, the, the lights that are in any given room, that one was put right there. That one was placed right there. That one was hung right there. That one was ordained to be there. That one was distributed right there. That one was fastened right there. That one was set right there. That's the exact same terminology that the Bible uses for what God did to those sun, moon, and stars out there. And think about a church. Think about a church service, okay? The church service is going on. All right, what is important to God? Are the lights important to God? No, what's going on in the room is what's important to God in the comparison of what's important. But what I want to mean by that is evolution has taken the importance of man and where we are and what God did and how and when and why God did it. He's taken the evolutionists have taken the importance of that and just shoved it down in the corner and stepped on it and covered it up with, with something. And, and the minimization of humanity, we're going to see this throughout some of these lessons. Uh, what, doesn't matter what branch of, of science, what field it is in. Now, I'm not anti-science. I like science. We do science experiments in our in our meetings. Science is good stuff. Science is fun stuff. But evolutionary science is science fiction. It is highly imaginative fiction, typically involving some actual or projected scientific phenomenon. It is science fiction that there was a big bang. It is science fiction that a little dot blew up, from, came from nothing. It is science fiction that over time, planets start forming the way they say they did. It is science fiction that at some point it cooled off enough to get water to, to where did water come from? I can't what it's from. It is science fiction that life started in a slime pit when a lightning bolt hit it. It is science fiction that life started in the water and climbed out onto land. It is science fiction that we came from some kind of ape-like creature. You get my point. It is a science fiction fiction thing that they have that they now call science and we get ridiculed as being as being creationists we get ridiculed as being ignorant but here's the problem what's taught in school and what's reinforced in the museums and reinforced on the discover channel and reinforced in every documentary is you, you see every reinforced in every publication magazine you see over and over and over is that evolution is true and more and more and more christianity is shoved out on, on a back burner somehow i'm telling you it's just absolutely amazing but, but the point is, what's important to God is not necessarily the lights. It's what's going on where he put. He said he made mankind in the image and likeness of him. He said the earth he put here to be inhabited. 
But what's interesting is in the middle of the Ten Commandments, he says, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. He talks about the heaven and all that's there, the earth and all that's there, the water and all that's there. It's all in there, folks. It's all in the Bible. It contains everything. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. That is an absolute true statement. No question about it. And it, tr it truly certainly does. I want to leave you with this thought, folks, the minimization of humanity. I implore you, get involved in your, tr in your children's lives because what is being taught to them, even, even if they have even if they're in a good school system, not trying to ridicule the school systems here, but I'm saying even if there's that, you got to realize they're still rubbing elbows with making friends with other kids, whether they're at church or whether they're at school or whether they're somewhere else. And there are all sorts of things being taught out there in the secular world that is anti-Christ. And most people a lot of times don't even realize the depth of it. So the, our children are learning from all kinds of different avenues and venues and things. We need to get involved in their lives. We need to know what the Bible says about various to all topics, but we need to especially get get ourselves up to up to speed when it's talking about science. The Bible is not opposed to science. The Bible is opposed to science falsely called so. And so that's where the problem is. But I hope you've enjoyed this small tidbit of information concerning the misconceptions about space. Thank you, Steve, for that fascinating, fascinating lesson. And we do want to tell everyone to go visit our website, creationseminar.net. We have 12 wonderful lessons that cover all the topics of creation. The first is, why is this important? The second lesson, Bible or billions. Third lesson, one of the most popular, Noah's big boat. Lesson four, after the flood. And lesson five, by far the most popular, misconceptions about space. Lesson six, an all-time favorite, all about dinosaurs. Lesson seven, words mean things. Lesson eight, maybe the most significant of all the 12 lessons, is Darwin's legacy. Lesson nine, rock solid proof. Lesson 10, the longest of them all, is living proof. Lesson 11, in six days. And lesson 12, questions and answers.